you would think that these camp slaves had something better to do uh, rather than go to a, a reunion with their former masters, but they did, and they did in fairly large numbers. I mean, as the, the image that you, the photograph you just referenced, um, there were 12 in that photograph, but there would have certainly been more at some of these UCB annual reunions. Um, th that was, I'm still left with a number of questions about what's going on in this, in this context. I think certainly um, some of these men are attending as a way perhaps to shore up their, whatever gains they've made during the post-war period back home, sure. right? I mean, remember that, you know, many of these former veterans are now leaders of their respective communities. Mm -hmm. So traveling with these men to a, a reunion and playing a certain role perhaps would have, uh, would have benefited them back home. I think also some of these men have likely had fond memories of of the war. I know that's, that's going to be controversial to say. Um, I don't think we should ever lose sight of the fact that we're talking about formerly enslaved people, but certainly we have to leave open the possibility that some of them remember the war as an adventure. Um, and perhaps, you know, if we're talking about a matter of a few decades after the war, they certainly would have um, perhaps renegotiated their memory of the war and, and perhaps highlighted things that uh, they did want to remember and recall with um, with former masters and, and former Confederate soldiers. Which, I, go it, ahead. Which yes. is an interesting question, yeah. interesting point to raise because of the kind of like where you say that maybe they're resyncing the memory of what took place. And you have these two or three really, really interesting episodes in there of um, these this guy going to these reunions and he's carrying chicken because he has a reputation of being an excellent chicken thief. That's right. And when I read through that section, it struck me a little bit of like, so in part here we're celebrating somebody who is a camp servant, yeah. slave, yeah. who is a thief, but considering most of the Confederate forces would have fought on southern soil, aren't we also celebrating somebody who is stealing from fellow Confederates. Yeah, I, I, you're, you're probably right about that, but I, but I think at the same time, the, f the camp slave who plays the role of the forager is also demonstrating, because you have to imagine, I think, that let, let's imagine uh, it's, it's foraging at a time when, when food is rare, right? right. Um, and so I think it's remembered as perhaps the clearest example of loyalty to either master or the mess in which that camp slave is located. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it's, 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 the, it's the loyal slave narrative played up, right? right? It's, it's a colorful narrative. And you know, there are a couple, Steve Eberhardt plays it up um, on multiple occasions. I think some of these men, especially Eberhardt, um, who uses a different surname when he's at a reunion than the one he used at home, I think in that case, he under, understood that he was entertaining. He Ooh. understood that he was playing a certain role. Perhaps he did that to maintain some kind of psychological distance from what he was doing. I think some of these men also perhaps made a little bit of money entertaining mm -hmm. these crowds. I mean, you have to imagine, especially the national reunions would have, would have attracted tens of thousands of people from all over the country. And so this is an opportunity for them, um, for, like I said, perhaps to make some money and, and make their mark. Which yeah. leads to another question, because when I read through the book, there was this I think it was a 1920s yeah. reunion that you have a picture in, and um, I was just in my mind thinking, we're talking about somebody who, the war's 60 years ago, right. and right. as a kid, even if it was a kid, we're talking about somebody who's in their 80s, and some of them may not have struck me as looking that age. Yeah. Are we maybe looking, like you somewhat suggest, individuals who are profiting? Yeah, and even um, some scam artists. Yes. I mean, there's at least one that I mentioned in the book named uh, Reverend uh, William Mac Lee, who uh, he's preaching in DC, he needs to raise money, and he publishes a pamphlet uh, placing him as Robert E. Lee's personal cook. And uh, there's, there's no evidence that, uh, that you know, he, was, he played that role. Uh, in fact, and, and you'll find images, photographs of this man all over the internet. Um, and so he, he, he succeeded, right, in convincing yeah. some people. Interestingly, he failed to convince the editor of Confederate Veteran Magazine. They outed him. They, they basically, uh, they, they, they published a piece 
basically um, denying any of his claims. And he went as far as, you know, to claim that he was, you know, with Lee and, you know, when he was making key decisions. That's, that did not sit well with, right. with Confederate veterans. So there were certainly some scam artists. Um, sure. I think most of the men that I've come across are, have a claim at, um, at being, uh, you know, legitimate. But I think you're right. I think that certainly it's possible that some people were uh, playing a role in, right. in doing a little scamming. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely.